Today, I have Sean Henry, who in the last three years has generated well north of $300 million for his clients online. His average client sees an increase of one to three million dollars a month in six months or less. And he walks us through exactly what he does when he starts working with a business in order to take him to that scale that quickly, as well as his most recent move to private equity and what he looks at when he's trying to acquire companies. Tell me what is one decision that you've made that has made all other decisions in your business easier? I would say something, but the camera's already rolling. I don't necessarily want to sell the business, but I realized if it's built on me, that is a cap and a limitation. So now it's about building systems. Many business owners are managing their own companies. When they could establish their own additional company that's called a management company. Investing in myself so that I can decide in what order I should be doing things. Sean, I ask everybody the exact same question when they first come on here. What is one of the easiest or simplest things that you have implemented inside your business that has made everything else easier? Yeah, 100% the biggest thing, especially the last few years, man, has been every single week we take like the whole team will set down, obviously start at the executive level, and then it'll go down to the individual teams. But we'll ask ourselves, okay, what are we trying to do this quarter? And then every single week, it's the same theme, the same talk. How can we achieve like that entire quarterly goal this week? Like if we only had this week to get it done, like, I mean, that's especially in advertising, right? Like people have standards, right? So the biggest, like for the longest time, I was like, oh, well, a million a month would take 12 months to do or 18 months. And the reason that we were able to get that time shorter and shorter and shorter is because we forced ourselves to. Every single week, the dialogue was literally like, how can we do it? But in one week's time, how can we do it? And, and it forced us to be able to like change it. So like, we're not going to let anything we've done up to this point or anything that anyone has done up to this point in terms of results or expectations or standards define what we can do in a short amount of time. But obviously, those short amount of times you know, extend into the macro or the long term. So that was 100% it, man. Where was that catalyst for you to switch it around to being like, not only like, can we hit a million dollars a month, but we can do this in the next seven days? Yeah. So what ended up happening is we had this client that we had scaled to 1.5 million a month. So we, we were at this point where they wanted to keep scaling. But part of, you know, and, and obviously with clients, like they have specific ways that they see their vision to scale. So it's kind of that, that yin and yang, right? Like we'll bring sprint and perspective and they'll bring their vision and it's our job. Like we're like a target. You have to like shoot us at something. And they had a low ticket offer that they were like, okay, we want to have this low ticket offer hit 2x, which was like, and again, like for the price point and in the industry, and I know, I know every, I know everybody in the industry. I know what the ROAS is. I know what's going on. Yeah, to have a low ticket hit two X is and and hard. again, exactly. And so the margins are terrible. And 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 again, like to where you want to hit like at least a two X, at least a two X was like the the dialogue. And so for us, it was like, well, we can go to and and we had this talk as a team. We had like basically a few options. It's one, fire the client because that's what they wanted to put their time. It was either two, we're gonna we're gonna like just all right, like we'll we'll try it, we'll see what happens. Or three, we use this as an opportunity to like creatively like how can people like we see what the rest of the industry is doing. We see what the best of the best are doing. And we're like, okay, well, we have to figure something out because we wanted to keep working with this client. We really believed in them and like we wanted to see them grow. So we were just like, okay, how are we going to do this? And so we're taking some of these principles and effectively came up with the system, which was kind of like, you know, traditionally in advertising, right? If we want to like dig, dig into it, there's been horizontal scaling, right? There's been vertical scaling. And we're like, well, Facebook, like especially in the last three years, really doesn't like horizontal scaling, right? It's been mostly vertical. So we were like, okay, how can we take the principles that, and and that's what allowed a lot of low ticket back in the day, right? Low ticket, you could you used to be able to hit like six x, yeah. but you can't anymore. So we were like, okay, what made that work back then, and how can we bring those principles? And so in this same case, it was like, okay, how can we accomplish like hitting effectively what they their constraints and this was like their demands basically <laughs> was hit 2x and scale to 10k a day in less than 60 days which was like 
again, like they had barely even cracked like 0.5 before. Wow. So we were just like, okay, we have to figure this out. And so we sat down as a team and we and, and we were like, okay, we think this is going to work. And we kept iterating, iterating, iterating. And not only that, we were able to scale to 5 million a month in a very short amount of time. And we were able to do that with high ticket. And then the cool part is once we took that to high ticket, right? The high ticket profitability just went like crazy because if low yeah, ticket margins could do it. On, so wait, what so, was like what was the big thing that you did on the low ticket side? So, give me like a, a few things. I'll give you, I'm no, curious. no, yeah, I, yeah. I'm, I'm and I'm a, I'm releasing like a free training with like all of this, yeah. and it's not even like a lead magnet. Like I just want to put it all out there just so people have it, especially because like I was telling you earlier before this, we're gonna move to private equity. I'm sure we'll talk about that more. Like go all, more all in on that. But the shift that we made was every. Every time that we would see, so we would launch ad set based optimization. We would find these because you know, like you could sometimes get like three, four X at really low budgets, right? But then as soon as you start to scale, scale it just diminishes. And so basically, the, the mindset shift, this is part of it. Obviously, there's a lot of different moving parts that went into this, but the big part was as soon as we, we'd launch all of these different ad size creatives and tests at really low budgets, right? And then we'd find these winners that are hitting 3x, 4x. And our goal is like, okay, how can we sustain that? Because if it's working here and we're finding people, then there has to be a way to find these people before the AI starts to basically fatigue or go crazy. And so every time we would find one of those winners, we would then run it through almost a conveyor belt of replicating successful actions. Because that's always been a principle on our team is like, whenever we find something, don't forget why it works and try to take why it works and re replicate successful actions. So this was the epitome of that. We literally take that and then we'd run it through a conveyor belt of other tests to then replicate successful actions, but at such a scale with um, different automations that we'd have in place to the point where basically all of those little wins that were three, 3x, 4x, 5x, 6x at low budgets were ended up spending enough over all of these different tests to where we were spending 10K a day with like these little tests. Basically. So what is what is the conveyor belt? What are some of these kind of automations um, and tests? Yeah, so we might run through like, again, like let's just say you find a winning piece of creative, right? Sure. So we're going to take that piece of winning for, so we'll start at the, the beginning. I guess I'll just give you all of it. Yeah, right? I mean, you don't have to do no, everything, but just no, so no, I can no, get I a better understanding well, of like if what I can, you mean. If I can help people make more money, I don't, I don't care. Like, sure. you know, like it's, at the end of the day, we don't work with that many clients anyway. So yeah. You know, like most of the people that are listening to this, we probably wouldn't end up working with. But if we can get wins, that brings value. So the big thing is this um, we launch a giant audience test with the winning piece of creative headline and body copy, right? So giant, giant in every way, shape, or form that we could do that, right? And then from there, as soon as we find a winning creative, then as soon as that pops off, we'll duplicate that in to its own audience and test set of tests to then be able to run headline, body copy, and then audiences again, right? So it, it literally self-replicates. And then as soon as we find another audience, right, or let's just say that winning audience that in, in the big audience test that popped off, we'll then take and run a bunch of creative to all of those same winning audiences that popped off before. Got it. Right? And it'll just keep replicating. It's almost like, imagine, you know how like a, in, in biology, right? Like you'll see a cell, it'll split. Right, and then that cell, those cells will split, and then those cells will split. So, 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 just split. to simplify for people that are listening, the idea behind it, and I could be mistaken, but let's say you run a, a bunch of different audiences with a few different creative, you find a winning, let's say in the first example, creative, then you take that creative and you split test it, or no, you find a winning audience. Yep. Then you take that audience and you split test it against different creatives, changing the headline, the body yep. copy, and then you flip 100%. it and do the exact same thing, and, and instead you're testing out the audiences against the winning creative. Audiences against the winning creative, and then as soon as another, and again, these variations will literally split off, so yeah. then you find another winning, let's just say, oh, that headline popped off, right? And you have all of these winning creatives that have gone off to other do their other stuff. Well, then that winning headline then gets tested against all of those, which then creates another win set of winners. Got which it. then again creates another set of winners. Are you seeing like a big variation in that? Which because I totally understand where you're coming from here, but like when you get to the this had like the third or fourth variation of the headline, sometimes you can see a point of diminishing returns on the split test. Was that the case, or was the goal not necessarily to beat out the variation, but instead at least maintain KPI so that you you could spend more money in a different asset. Yeah. Or, uh, so it's like you have minimum KPIs, yeah. right? So whatever is minimum, 
then anything, you know, above, anything that. below anything above oh, yeah. that, yeah, exactly. So yeah. anything below that's just cut. But the idea isn't to outperform. The idea is again rep- replicating successful actions because what's the and and for anybody that's watching, like that's running ads, like you know, the enemy of your success is ad fatigue, right? That's that's basically like the only thing. As soon as you find a winner, right? The only thing that'll stop you from just spending more money, in theory, is ad fatigue, mm-hmm. right? And again, when you look at like scaling, it's exponential. So you maybe you're scaling by ten to thirty percent a day. Maybe you're scaling by thirty percent every three days if you want to add more breaks in between. Um, but the big piece is if you you have to consider how AI works, right? AI works from and and if you view chat GTP, maybe you've seen this too. It's like at some point you get the same answers over and over and over again. And that's what ad fatigue is. It's the AI model at some point optimizing to the point where it plateaus and then you get law of diminishing returns. That's what at least ad fatigue is. And so the idea is if you find winning creatives and you're able to then feed through more data to the AI to all of the different campaigns, right? The more winners that you find, the more you're feeding the the algorithm for that specific winning creative or that specific winning audience or whatever, you're keeping it fresh. You never get to a point. So even if one of your campaigns that's crushing it fatigues, you're not relying on it anymore because by that point, you've already probably found two more winners or three more winners or five more winners that are going to take the place of that ad that just fatigued. And how how many how uh, and this is actually really interesting, and I'm learning a few things from this as well. Like, how quickly are you creating uh, new ads to test once you find the winner? Is it like same day duplicating it, and then how much budget are you putting? It depends it, on it depends on your budget, right? Yeah. So let's look at it two ways. With low ticket, it's you know they go to a cart, they buy, you have that profit in your pocket right away, right? If you're running high ticket. You run into multiple. You run into different um, scenarios. If you're running high ticket, you could bottleneck at your sales team, right? You just they can't take that amount of calls anymore. You bottleneck at fulfillment. The fulfillment. You bottleneck at, um, or you're just you're scaling up. You're just starting, so you need to wait for that creative or the cash to come in so that you can put more to ad spend. Or you're waiting. Let's just say if you just started, right? You don't know your data. Let's just say cost per call isn't what matters. Like you know that. Like yeah. cost per call is is amazing. And actually, with this, if you take this and apply it, your cost per call should just drop. It should just like literally. I mean, if you were hitting a hundred dollar cost per call, like we've seen it go down to like twenty dollars, fifteen dollars, like crazy stuff. And so with this, it's like, you know, if you're just starting, you'll scale to a point where you you need to wait for the the calls to happen to yeah. then analyze lead quality. So for example, like you might have your data team or whoever's running the ads, or maybe it's yourself, you're going to go in and your first metric of success is how qualified are the leads financially, allegedly, right? And then you get actual call feedback, right? And then you can optimize around that first. And then your next thing would be getting sales. And then once you get sales, again, you can optimize around that. But the time between the book call and the sale might be three days, five yeah. days. And so the constraint being... You know, again, if you have, you know, if you have a sales team that can handle the capacity to scale to three million a month, which again we've seen this happen in in really short amounts of time, it's like if you're getting the success and you're repeating successful actions and you're duplicating, you're on it, and you're actually just completely replacing or or replicating this process over and over and over again. At some point, you're going to reach a bottleneck. But I mean, with us and why we were talking like before, like. I think the reason why we've been so successful in our w- with our clients and now why we're just kind of taking the approach of now just hey why don't we just partner with these clients in the first place so they can get our e- entire team infrastructure is you know at that point sales and marketing doesn't it's not an issue anymore. It's a non-issue. So now you got to focus on the other bottlenecks. I want to segment into the PE private equity here in a moment as well. Uh, a few kind of rapid fire questions. What's the most amount of money you guys have spent either managed for clients or for yourself or one person a day in ad spend? We, I mean, we've spent upwards of five hundred thousand dollars a day. Really? Yeah, for clients. For a low ticket or high ticket offer. High ticket offer. And uh, well, high ticket offer. One client for a high ticket offer. That client ended up scaling to a hundred million, um, and then actually exiting. Five hundred thousand so, dollars going to a call funnel. Uh, going to a call funnel. Yeah. How they many had a, sales calls is that being booked in a day? 
Yeah, so we were we were booking close. So at at that scale, it was about one hundred and fifty dollars per call. But they were their average ticket value was about seven thousand dollars per purchase, and so they were booking anywhere from a thousand calls a day, depending on like the day, to like five thousand calls. How a day. many salespeople did they have? They had upwards. Uh, I think they had. I, I mean, I, I think they probably had like a thousand salespeople. Oh my god! Yeah. It's a they huge had, company. Yeah, it's a huge company, but they ended up actually exiting. So it was a it was a big um, tax firm. So that was that was back in the day. But now, um, but we've also seen this scale. We've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars a day for like ecom businesses and stuff. But I don't really um, like supplement companies to so. do it on the on the low ticket. I get and I can totally see that having run low ticket funnels at scale uh, for our own company and for our clients. But a high ticket where you have to have salespeople. Yeah, I mean, legit. shit, that's hard. Well, it, it's hard, but I always say this when we go into a new team with high ticket. It's like, you know, usually it's this constant battle between sales and marketing. Like, marketing says the leads are good. Sales says the leads, leads are, are bad. Shit. And it's like, whatever. So we have we have a principle in our team that um, anything the sales team says goes. And it's our job just to make this the leads better. Even if the leads are good, then if they're saying the leads are bad, then it's our job to make them the best they've ever got. And like, and so, and then from there, it's like, I'll go in to talk to the CEO and be like, listen, it's your responsibility to make sure your sales team is doing well. I trust you to do that and if the, and to identify if the leads are good or bad. But if you tell us the leads are bad, we'll figure it out. Um, and so with that specific client, we, we we basically just built a funnel that was consistently warming warming up warming up warming up and at some point it, the leads became good enough that at scale that a team of that size could actually close but they also had a ton of authority like it was a really like their offer was really really good really strong so yeah it was a very strong offer with a company that had a ton of notoriety got it yeah Wow, that's insane! Yeah, that, that you might take the cap on a high ticket five hundred thousand dollars a day. That's pretty damn Thanks, impressive. I wish I wish I was still selling for them, but they get acquired, and the firm that took them over has their own marketing team. Yeah, so. no, I mean, it makes a whole lot of sense. It. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So uh, I know. I think when we were discussing even. Um, inside of scaling with systems uh you were talking about private equity kind of casually back then and now when i just first saw you a second ago you were like we're going all in on yeah. private equity now so uh talk to me a little bit about you know obviously even in the world i just took on my first portfolio company a few months ago that's awesome, doing really man. Congratulations. well Congratulations! thank you and so like i can see obviously appeal to it um, and obviously a way to build some serious wealth. I think that 99% of people get it, into it way too early, uh, in my opinion, just based yeah. on like what I'm saying. It's like almost uh, almost what Alex Ramosi has done has made it like a shiny object to go do what is like reserved for the elite 1%. Not elite 1% as in money, but elite 1% as in like identifying deals and scaling companies. And they've made it like a new shiny object thing. So I talk to people and they're like, oh yeah, I got a few portfolio companies. And I'm usually like, all right, that means that these things are kind of garbage. Like there's no way you can really run these companies successfully because they're typically the CEO of like six companies. So they're calling their portfolio companies, but there's, I've been the CEO of multiple companies. It's fucking difficult to do. Like, no. I mean, really difficult to do, but if you have, there's an executive team in place there and you're coming in and you're solving one problem inside of that. And maybe it's not even you, it's your team that's doing it. It makes a lot more sense. So, For sure. Well, and to your point, right? Like the big thing is like that most people miss is like, oh, this is the way her Hormozzi is building wealth, right? But the only reason he can do that is because he's actually bringing value, right? And at the end of the day, it's like, A, he's building value and he's looking at it in, as a form of leverage, right? And leverage being, it's the, like, I, def I define leverage probably the same way that most people do. It's like the least amount of work for the most amount of result, right? And that's his least amount of work for the most amount of result. Um, and then for most of the people that you're talking about, it's how can I add more businesses so that I can, you know, if I'm making, you know, 100K a year now, how can I make now 200K a year by acquiring a business? It's like, well, that's not leverage. Yeah, that's it makes no sense. just creating double the work. And when Hormozzi did it, it was after he had exited a company for $100 million. So like, you know, that's the, uh, the, a few facts that people believe. But but that for aside, sure. you're so obviously you've generated over $300 million for your clients, which is really impressive. And now you're pivoting to the private equity side of things. Like why the pivot? Um, is it you just kept on seeing uh, the money you were making your clients and you're like, I want a piece of it. And then like, 
like rough deal terms. You don't get in the actual nitty gritty, but one of the things we do on this podcast is we do go deep on a lot of stuff. This isn't like a high level podcast. So when you do work with a client, is it percentage of, of the equity? Is it percentage of revenue? Is it percentage of profit? Like what does that typical structure look like? Let's put private equity to the side. Like okay. even all the years we've been running our marketing agency, it's percentage of profit after ad spend. Got it. So because profit I've always defined as revenue, revenue minus, minus ad spend, ad spend Got is it. profit. So it's really yeah. marketing contribution budget because technically profit was also included. Correct. Yeah, Correct. All the other stuff. But Correct. Yeah. And and well in that case, but in, in that regards, right, the um when th- that to in in its purest form is the only way to at least in our mind a it's fair to the business owner because then it's just like well let's otherwise let's just spend all the money in the world let's sure. spend like you know let's spend a million dollars a month and then you know regardless of what or happens we just make. yeah it doesn't yeah. matter and so a that's how we've retained our relationships for so long um but b if you look at it in terms of there's there's certain risk Right. So for a team like ours, I think at any given time we're working with under 15 clients. Like we're not, we're not taking on all of these, you know, we're not trying to take on as many clients as we can. We're trying to go as deep as we can. And so there's actually a certain degree. And while I respect our clients' risk because they're taking the risk to work with us, there's also the risk to work with them as well because there has to be an incentive for the business owner to run an efficient business as well. And so their, their incentive to, maintain more profit in their business is to optimize the operations. And then our incentive to make sure the marketing is just crushing, they never have to worry about marketing again and sales again, is to make sure the marketing is profitable as possible. So that's why we structure it, you know, revenue minus profit. And then that's that's us taking on the risk because we need to, in order for it to, us to even be worth it at this point, it's like we need to scale them multiple millions of dollars a month, yeah. more than what they're doing now. Um, because it's also only what we're generating it has nothing yeah, it's not, not, literally not we don't channels. even exactly we don't even touch whatever else they're generating um but then so to bring it into the the structure of the deals that we're we're creating it's for us then what we can do is instead of because there's inherent value in just acquisition and we respect that obviously the the business owner's right to um to profit and building their business as big as possible at this point you know with most of the clients that we're looking to work with and we'll still structure a rev share deal um if if it's a really good partner and they're already well developed and they don't want to give up a percentage of their business um but for the business owner that's maybe doing 200k a month 100k a month you know 300k a month and they're they're and just to keep in mind as well any acquisition we do is also contingent um, equity is contingent on um, a certain degree of revenue being created. So it's like we will our our equity will stake, so to speak, once we hit a million a month, once we hit two million a month. Because otherwise, again, what's the point? Of, like that's the value we bring. So we need to do what we say we're going to do. And so, and this is obviously if you're getting equity, this is obviously with the goal to eventually exit the company. Mm-hmm. Yep. A hundred percent, and and that's that's the big thing to where it's like with the companies that we're taking equity in, they're they're super happy to do it. We've already done it many many times. Uh, I think well, not many many times. Um, we have our we have a private equity. Just to be clear, I have a PE firm mm-hmm. with me and a, a few buddies where we acquire online e-commerce businesses, um, and that portfolio is at a, about twenty million right now a year in revenue. Um, but that's that's not what necessarily what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is there are online high ticket consulting or service based businesses that want us to come in and partner with them. Um, and instead of paying us our retainer, which is substantial, no retainer, um, rev share and equity contingent on even just creating results. So the risk upfront is actually insanely minimal. Um, and then once we start hitting specific metrics, RevShare kicks in. And then once we hit specific metrics, um, the equity kicks in. Hey guys, really quickly, if you're getting value out of this, please be sure to share it wherever you share things. Share it with your friends, your colleagues, your employees. Share it to somebody that you know needs to hear this message. We put an incredible amount of work into these videos and these episodes for you. And all I ask in return is for simply to share it to somebody else that wants to hear that or needs to hear this message. All right, let's get back to it. So, but for you, because I've obviously had a bunch of people offer me equity for their company, but like equity is really only valuable if the company is exitable. And I'd say 90% of companies, this is me throwing out random numbers, but just in my experience, 90% of companies are nowhere near exitable. So for you to take value in the company by saying, I'll take some equity in it, 
like, are you looking beforehand and saying, okay, because based on everything you have here, there's value in me to take equity? Mm -hmm. Or because I feel like the majority of the time, I like, I'd be like, just as an example, if I didn't have a great company to exit, I'd be like, yeah, sure, here's 20% of my company. But in reality, it's never going to exit. So yeah. I saved myself from spending more money to you. Uh, and I gave you pretty much like toilet paper and I yeah. don't have to worry about it. So is there like due diligence beforehand or what does that look yes. like? Yes. So 100% due diligence. And we're obviously looking for individual companies to be able to exit, right? So that's that's one piece. But at least a few of our my mentors that are worth more than a billion dollars and they've done a lot of work in PE and stuff like that. I think what a lot of people overlook and and just just maybe this will help you with some perspective for as you go into PE as well. The the reason that, and, and as far as I understand it, right? I could be completely incorrect, but the way I understand it is the the PE firms they trade lump sum for cash flow. Right, that's just in its simplest terms. That's why you would acquire a business, and so and and then obviously be able to grow it and then exit again. But it's not just the value of the individual companies; it's also the value of the holding company, right? So even if you have, and and this is we're still buying. Just to be clear, we are buying businesses that we know we can exit. But if those businesses are cash flowing, and they're going to be around, and their sustainability and the systems are built inside of our portfolio company, each of those individual companies has those systems, even if they can't exit, the the cash flow of the portfolio company is built to exit. Like sure. our portfolio business, even if the business is inside of it, and theoretically you, couldn't exit. When you say portfolio business, you're talking about our, the our holding, holding company. company rather. Exactly. Yes, our, our holding company, even though theoretically, and again, even though we are building or buying companies that are exitable, yeah. even, even if those companies weren't as exitable or harder to exit, the holding company is insanely valuable because of the consistent cash, cash flow. flow and the deal flow that we have, right? The deal flow consistently coming in of businesses that want us to acquire. And so it's that doesn't even go away. And so it there, I think there's two parts to it. It's like, yes, each individual business I want to be able to exit. So yes, we're 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 doing our due diligence. We have specific um parameters that we look at when we're looking at a business. So we need to make sure that they have at least a, a foundational executive team. Um, we need to make sure that at least in the next six months, the personality, if there is a personality brand behind it, the business can actually eventually removed. like be removed um, over the next six months, which is actually not that difficult. Um, it's just, it just has to be intentional and they have to want to do it, uh, which most of them do because they want to be able to exit their business at some point. And so those are some of the things that we look at. Does that make sense? Though? It does, actually. That was it lent a lot of clarity. And I like, uh, just for those listening back at home, if I can simplify even more, the value of the company is not just in the fact that it's exitable. It's the fact that specifically in the online coaching, consulting, high ticket space, the cash flow in these companies. Like, I don't think a lot of people, if they're listening right now that are not in this world, understand how amazing the cash flow is in these companies that like the high ticket coaching, consulting space, yeah. the profitability and cash flows unbelievable. I mean, it's not really, and cash flow is not, you know, how much like, cause a Amazon business can make $10 million a month, but what is the take home of that company? Yep. And so uh, I think that's the huge benefit of the coaching consulting. And you're saying the, the benefit of you taking equity in that is not necessarily that that company is going to exit. It's that that cash flow monthly bundled up with all the other cash flow monthlies makes the holding company much more valuable. Correct? Yeah, for sure. And, and it's also like the way that we're going to proceed going forward our entire inflow, like the way that we're building the holding company and the company that sources the deals and the way that we're sourcing deals, it never goes away. It is it is because of the results that we're creating at a fundamental level and, and the way that we'll structure this. Although I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll have to tell you off camera just because it is <laughs> kind of our secret sauce why this is going to work so well. Um, and I'm sure people would love to replicate it. <laughs> but um, the big thing is, the businesses that are coming in consistently to us, like they want us to take minority share in their business. And where where are they? Is it just referrals, or how are they finding you? Um, they are they are clients in a matter of speaking that okay. we've already. They are people in some way, shape, or form that we've already delivered results for. Got but it. it's at such a wide scale that, and right now especially, that. That they want us to do that, but especially considering like even the the speed in which we're growing revenue, it's like it could take uh, it could take another business 
years or never to reach some of the things that we're doing as far as marketing. Um, so we are looking, obviously, also when we're looking at these businesses, we're looking at for CEOs that like have a lot of clarity like we audit not just the business but we audit audit the ceo um because the the vision has to be there but also they have to be incredibly structured and they have to know exactly how they would scale because i mean you understand like scaling an eight-figure business is no joke yeah like it's no joke <laughs> fulfillment is a, is is a real real it's problem. it's almost never a problem with marketing like it is literally it's almost always like marketing will work and then you're scaling, and then going back to that five hundred thousand dollars a day, it almost always will be operations uh, around hiring, firing people, like the you know a thousand salespeople, or fulfillment, like actually yeah. delivering. Well, definitely don't take for granted the the marketing and sales. I know, obviously, you've got. Oh no, I mean that's what we built our whole business exactly. on. I'm not, no, no, no. I'm saying that most people think, oh yeah, all I need to do is just spend more money on ads, and I'll be at a million dollars a month. For and sure. I'm like, you, you'll have the ability to be at a million dollars a month. There's no yeah. doubt about it. But no, you're right, and thanks for stopping me. I'm not discrediting anything that you and I spent our oh, whole no, life no, doing. No, I'm for just, sure. Well, yeah. and I, and more just more just to the point, like you know, for. There, there are people that are really, really good at systems and there are people really good at marketing and there are people that are really good at both. And that's one of the reasons that I respect you so much, bro, is just like I I see I see the how much attention you put towards the entire picture. And that's just for me, that's just that's why I want to have these dialogues and why like, you know, you're coming to Vail later this month, being able to work with your team, like that's why I respect you, bro. Because you you don't just look at one piece of the puzzle. And to be fair, again, like the marketing and sales, that's a big piece of the puzzle that most people never solve, period. But then to take that even further and be able to do that, I mean, I know even just from the way that you, like I've heard people that I know really closely where you source their operations people and they can't speak more highly of it. So it's like, again, like you have to give yourself credit too, man. Like I it's, appreciate it's you saying sick. that, man. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we obviously love working with you as well, and I've learned quite a bit. And I, uh, I will say, when I read Rocket Fuel for the first time, uh, he talks about visionaries and like integrators. Yeah. And he says like less than four percent of people are both of them. And in a very self awareness way and not like a cocky way. I think I am the person that is both a visionary and an integrator because like I can see what I want to do, but then. I can do all of the systems around the implementation. That's amazing, of it. man. Yeah. I I I'm only a visionary. I, I think the majority of people I meet are just literally <laughs> just the visionary side of things, and it's like um, kind of blows like my, uh, my team away sometimes. And I'm just like, hey, I came up with this idea Friday night at eight o'clock, and we woke up Saturday morning, and like this entire system's built out to solve it. And this is not a cocky thing. I'm really grateful for that. I don't know if it was something I learned or if that's just like how the universe played, but um, it is it blows my mind how quickly we can move that way. And I wanted to ask you because. I get varying uh, answers to this. Going back to the PE world, like multiples. If you're exiting a coaching consulting business, I'm sure it'll vary drastically. But like, I'm curious in the e-commerce world and in the uh, in the like coaching consulting world, what are you seeing on multiples on EBITDA? If you are seeing any, uh, I mean, transparently, we haven't tried to exit, even yeah. even exit any of the coaching consulting. But for I mean, for e-com, it's like. Seven to ten. Really? Yeah. Because and and the only reason is so our 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 criteria is finding a business that already has the supply chain set up. It has the fulfillment. So obviously we'll look at that. Um, and usually what we'll look for is we want to see that they grew organically, and that's how they grew. Because then what we do when we bring it in, they can only the organic people can only sell for a certain multiple, right? And then we'll acquire them. But We'll literally just go and we plug in our cold traffic. We plug in our email systems because, again, like most, even most econ businesses, surprisingly, their email is insanely weak. And so we'll plug in that and we'll plug in our email. And just adding that, A, it's going to start scaling, but just having multiple acquisition channels that are consistently and in, in proven to produce revenue, we've seen insane Huge multiples. increases. Yeah. So, so what is the, like, I kind of want to get a little bit tactical on, uh, we talked about the ads a little bit, but like you come into a business, they're doing $200,000 a month. I think you and I were talking about, um, even in the scaling, in scaling initiative, you were saying average client gets... Uh, one to three million dollars a month in top line added in six months or less. Yeah. So huge feat to be able to do something like that. Obviously, you have to work with the right clients, but let's say it's the right client when they start. What are like either a few mistakes that they were doing previously that prevented them from scaling, or like what are the first few things that you'll do to them in order to get them? Because six months is not a lot of time to get someone to three million dollars a month. So mm -hmm. like, what are some of the things that you'll do? And I know we said ads, but like, is there anything else you're looking at? Like every time we pull this lever, cash comes out. 
Yeah, I mean, it is like we are obviously super picky, so we want to make sure their teams are able to do it. And they like again, I'm a I'm a visionary. We can so some of the things that I'll do is I my COO is an absolute powerhouse, so she'll go in and she'll just rip apart their systems and just what's going on. Um, and and like, and, what are some of the usual things they're doing wrong? I don't know if you know. Yeah, so you're... so. A lot of it. So I I work in terms just how my brain works, and and my friends know this. It's like I, I have ADHD, so like I only have a certain amount of time to focus on something, which means I have to focus on the right things. I think it's an asset in that way, mm-hmm. but it also makes it to where I'm a weak integrator. It's harder for me to do sustained like problem solving that takes like over days, right? Um, but what what we'll see is. Like for example, like we'll go in and everything that I do is based off of bottlenecks, right? So I'm like, you know, I can identify the marketing bottlenecks pretty easily. But mm-hmm. you're kind of asking like some of the other things. Yeah. So what we'll do is we'll make sure that they have full company tracking. So literally map out the entire sales process, sales cycle from mark like literally be able to see it. So from marketing to the transition to sales, um, setting rates, like answer rates, um, like how long does it take? setters to call, how long is like things like this. Anything that can raise up profitability, but I'm not looking at like, hey, let's just raise it by five percent. I'm looking for the big blaring like red KPIs yep. that like, hey, this is the easiest thing that we can double. Right. Like I'm really like I'm always just looking like what's the easiest thing that I can double right now or triple right now or quadruple right now. And so we'll look at that. And even to the handoff on the operate on the fulfillment side, like we'll just set up the metrics so they can track it. Like how long does it take to do this? What's your refund rate? All of these things. And most businesses just don't have that. Yeah. Even especially in, in in the coaching consulting space, especially high ticket. So um as far as like making sure that they're ready to scale, our our whole goal is just having live perspective for what 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 is the biggest bottleneck right now? Well, because I'm a l- little bit of a geek. What so- software are you using? If you or is it just sheets? What are you using to actually track the uh, the numbers? So it's it's it it depends, right? So if they were we're just huge. We probably like six months ago switched over to go high level, and that's helped a lot because everything's all in one place. Yep. Um, but as far as like sales stuff, um, we'll like Twilio. Like we're able to track basically set up Zapier's Zapier, Zapier advanced Zapier as well as like adding time and doing like math basically to where okay from the time a lead comes in to the time that a Twilio or you know a you know a call goes off yep. we're able to track that time so it's like average. And time then to where call. do you display that number? We'll throw it in like a sh- that'll that'll then go through Zapier into a sheet and then Got that it. goes into a data studio. What's your what's a good average? I mean, obviously we have our numbers, but like for you, what's a good average time? Obviously, I know you're gonna be like zero, but from a lead comes in less to than five minutes, less than five minutes for sure during the day, less than five minutes. I think over the we we tracked a ton of data. What we saw is. Um, if you don't call within five minutes, at least like the setter, like making can at least a uh, and one thing that we've done to get our show rates over eighty percent is just having, and I'm sure you do this as well. It's just having an appointment setter or just setter call every application or book call that comes in within five minutes, yeah, and just get them pumped for the call. That'll raise it up a ton. Um, but what we've seen is from time that lead comes in, um, if you don't call them within five minutes, you lose seventy percent. Wow, you lose seventy percent, like basically efficient, like chance of them actually picking up, and then from ten minutes you lose out of that seventy percent, you lose fifty percent of those leads. If you don't call within thirty minutes, you actually lose out of those fifty percent of those leads, you lose up to seventy percent of those leads, and then after that it's just law of diminishing return. Like you are just like ruining your chances of the lead showing up. And uh, that's so, that's nuts. We actually implemented a automated text message to at least because you know when you have so many leads coming in it. We get an automated text message that it's like a four minute delay that goes out to that. And then mm-hmm. I don't think our outbound dial is underneath five minutes, but we do track it. Even for our tickets for like our uh, email mm-hmm. support system, we track that as well. But well, have you so have you read the book, um, Predictable Revenue? Oh, great book. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. And that, that for us was like the big um, eye opener. It was like, we'll, we'll just tell the team, like, we never want to have like the best closers doing setting, et cetera, right? Which was like kind of one of the big themes of the book. Yeah. But also just setting up a dedicated team 
that literally every application that comes, I mean, it's not actually that difficult to call within five minutes as long as you have like three, four people. Yeah. Um, that's just literally all their only job is to call up the leads, just get them on the phone, get them excited, and then your show rates just go like. Do crazy. you know what a uh, so for us, like we try to do like 15 to 18 percent lead to booking rate, and these are people that have not automatically booked on their mm-hmm. own through the funnel. Mm-hmm. What is the metric that you guys look at? What's the percentage that you guys look at as well? Um, that we actually look thirty. Like if we can, we'll get it up to thirty percent. If wow. the, if the team's hitting it, B two B or B two C? B two B. Okay. Yeah, they should be able. Um, if if the team's calling within five minutes and they're on it, they should be able to get thirty percent. And you have your automated lead nurture sequences and stuff yeah. like that. So between those two things, you should be able to actually book thirty percent. Very cool. And uh, all right, setters, operations. You kind of talked about that. Give me like one or two more things I can give the audience of like what is <laughs> like some good things you look at. You're like we yeah. gotta fix this asap. Um. I mean, those are those are the main things. I think, and what's relevant, at least for most people, is fixing sales and sales and marketing, or fixing like fulfillment. So, I mean, the time, whatever. I mean, if it's if you have a done with you service, then what is the the your retention? Let's just say it's a recurring service to be able. To, and this doesn't really go back in our pocket, but you know, the more we can make our clients the better. Yeah. Um. So, well, the time that it takes to onboard. Um, the the K one thing that a lot of done with you services don't have is a key result percentage, right? So the time that it takes basically for them to reach a Whatever key, they result, is the key that, result that that's and and if they get that X key result, then that person will stay into perpetuity yeah. basically. And so we, we that originated in SaaS. SaaS was the people that nailed that. Oh yeah, for yeah. sure, a hundred percent because they knew that, especially within the free trial. Right, they had like seven days, basically, like to get them on, get them, get them like the their list. The first yeah, time. Their it was list actually in, it was on. literally Layla Hermosi was at my house in 2019 uh, with Alex, and she was the first person that introduced me. She was like, "Stop copying what everyone's doing on the uh, coaching consulting side." She said, yeah. "Go read these books from these SaaS founders about retention, because like you said, they have the actual data to be like, cool. In the first 24 hours, they need to uh, invite it for. And a lot of people don't know this, but." Uh, Facebook was able to explode because what they identified was that if they ha- if they invited at least 10 friends within the first seven days, the person would stay on forever. And so what wow. they did was they, I didn't know that. yeah, they actually, uh, they, Chamath is the guy's name that came up with it. I don't know if you know who Chamath mm-hmm. is. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was, yeah, like, I watch his podcast. Yeah, he's like, epic. I, I love yeah. that guy. Yeah, yeah they're, they're awesome. awesome. And uh, so he was head of growth at Facebook or some kind of title around that. And he took them to over a billion users by making it so that you invite friends. I know, None of us have signed up for Facebook in like fucking twenty years. But yeah. when you join, you invite. I'm sure you and I maybe created a few fake Facebook accounts or some ads <laughs> before. But yeah. um, when you yeah. join, it immediately asks you to. Like uh, you might know these people. Exactly. You, you should invite, invite these them. Friends. Yeah. Exactly. So like That's crazy. these software companies have identified, and like you said for the free trial, like do these things first. And we even uh, are doing that in our company as well. It's like cool. What do we need to do to get a win? You know, we call it a ring the bell, as you obviously know. And it's like yep. what is required. How long from when they join to when we get launch the campaign, from when they jo- join to get the the return on investment, like those are all the stuff we track. And then the in between, I think, is like what you said. I we call them activation points, but it's like what is what do they need to get done in order to start getting that person to see success, renew, uh, refer, uh, ascend, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, for sure. And so when you're when you're tracking that and you're kind of identifying that. Um, what are some of the things that you really like to look at in terms of like timeframes? Are you looking at it like, hey, within the first seven days, within the first 30 days? Are you like, well, it just what do you like to look at? Yeah, so it depends, right? Uh, so for us, we want, uh, our goal is to have the entire marketing system installed and running within 72 hours after their onboarding call. So that's like, as soon as they have the onboarding call, clock's running. We have a sauna task to set everything up and then get the entire marketing system up. Because the big mistake that people make is like, okay, let's say you offer someone 100% return on investment in like uh, 30 days. Well, the problem that people do is most people dick around for the first 14 to 20 days. Then you finally get the ads or the email launched. And then, you know, it's going to take three days to start getting booked calls. Then another four days after that to actually have those calls show up. Then another four days after that to start taking your first sales calls, assuming everything works perfectly. So you're like right on the cusp of that second payment uh, or of that 30 days and you are start, they're just starting to close their deal and that's assuming everything goes right. What mm-hmm. we learn is like if we can get the marketing system built and installed and running in the first three days then we have a lot of time to be able to handle what happens if people aren't booking calls, what happens if they're not showing up, what happens if this person sucks at closing and before they make that second payment or before the 30 days is up, we have uh, we have got them the ROI. So yeah. like for us, 
our, our client success team, I'm literally like, you know, even though we work with people for 90 days and then obviously, you know, they renew or ascend or whatever else it is, I'm like those first 30 days and really the first 14, we should do the entire transformation in the first, that's what we, we aim for, full ROI in the first 14 days. Yeah. Uh, and we don't get it every time, but that's like, I had a meeting with our client success director today about how we're tightening it up even more. Um, and we're doing some really cool stuff. Like we just hired a campaign manager who's actually going to do it all for our client success managers. So I'm just like always focusing on that because the the key metric that Layla was telling about what they look at inside of software companies is time to value. So like how can we shorten time to value? Yep. And so the value for our clients is going to be the marketing system running. Then the value is going to be the actual campaign uh, getting a return on investment. And then obviously it would be like two, three, four X times after that. For sure. And it sounds like obviously in, in order for you to have figured that out, it sounds like you're actually like... I feel like a lot of CEOs, like especially in terms of once they they get a team installed, they kind of like take a step back and they lose perspective. It sounds like you're pretty tapped into like oh, it's, uh, client the, results and like what's going on. There's and no like other department matters. I'm that tapped into than even even less. I used, to, I mean, maybe marketing because I'm just like good at marketing. But I realized in the beginning of 2022, and these are great great questions. I realized in the beginning of 2022, like if I wanted to take my company where I wanted to take it to, it was going to be on ascensions, referrals, renewals. It wasn't going to always be front end acquisition. Like I didn't yeah. want to have a company reliant only on front end acquisition. So uh, and I. Knew Knew that if I could get really great results, that would then lead to better marketing and case studies, et cetera, et cetera. Like for sure. I was tired of just spending like 400 grand a month and making like, you know, uh 1.5x, you know, which is this is for another offer. I was like, okay, I need to figure out how we can scale it and I can get in uh, 10x, 20. And and once again, if you have a really amazing offer, like that tax uh, company you're talking about, it makes the marketing a million times easier. So yeah, like it sure. all kind of played together. So yeah, every Monday I do a one hour alignment call with our full client success team so I can stay on the pulse of everything. Um, and then I meet with my uh, client success director every Friday. Um, and I'm literally like the two channels I check the most is our support email channel. So like when people send in support emails and that's usually like admin stuff, but just so I can move things around and then our client success channel. And we have MPS surveys that go out 40 days, you know, MPS is hmm. net promoter score, like some of the largest. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So MPS surveys sure. go out uh, every and within 45 days. We have a pre onboarding call survey to get engaged where they're at, a post onboarding call survey. Every time they finish a one on one call, they get a survey requesting feedback. So we're just like obsessed with feedback. So even if I don't talk to anybody, I can see what's going on just from the feedback. And, and those all zap into a uh, Slack channel for us. For sure. What's a, like for you, what have you noticed is like one of the, like things that has surprised you the most in terms of like what dictates like success and in terms of like somebody actually like in anything they start, right? Like, you know, but as specifically, obviously you, you talk to a lot of business owners. So what do you think is like that one thing that like surprisingly dictates somebody's ability to get uh, success? Almost always like, are you saying like for our, us to serve our clients? or no, just, just what you've general? noticed. Yeah, just in general. I mean, like in terms of you start serving your client, like what's something that like, you've noticed is important for business owners to either they either need to do this or they need to think this like they need to have a certain well, mindset so like what's I, something that like i guess surprised you yeah the for me it was um and, and it's something that we did like four or five months ago and now I like tell all of our clients to do it and you kind of alluded to it at the very beginning but it's like really nailing down who you're supposed to serve because if we go back to time to value and all this stuff like so let's take a step back and we go back to I want to launch an advertising campaign or a marketing system in three days well if this person literally like just launched their offer if they have like no sales or they have no sales team or uh, they have never uh, done anything online before or they're making three thousand dollars a month like it's going to be really hard to get a full end to end marketing system sure. up in like three instead days. of serving like everybody like, exactly which, like again like you go deeper so we created this one pager and i have a youtube video that goes more in depth on it but it's like cool must be doing minimum eight thousand dollars a month of recurring revenue uh must be uh have a sales cycle that's less than 45 days and so by us getting really specific with who we serve we were able to increase our close rate. We were able to decrease our cost per booked call, increase our dollar per call, de decrease cost per acquisition, increase cash per close, lower time to value, all by just actually, ironically enough, and this is where to go to credit to what you said, what surprised us, by saying no to more people, we were able to 
make more money. It was kind of, I, I thought that when we went that narrow, the audience pool was going to be so small that we weren't going to be able to make enough money. For sure. But ironically enough, you know, last month was a record month. This month we're on track for a record month. So it's like, it's kind of crazy how that went into play. And, um, and I actually am running no ads right now because we, um, don't have like going back to the, the very beginning about that person that had, that had a thousand salespeople. I'm like trying to find salespeople right now um, yeah, for sure. and trying to hire and ramp them up. But yeah, almost always the biggest thing that I notice, at least for a company that's like, you know, in the let's say fifty to three hundred thousand dollar a month mark, like uh, which are a lot of clients that we work with, it's that what got them to the point to be there is that they served everybody, and what gets them to the point to the seven figures a month is serving one avatar in a productized service, like over and over and over again. Yeah, for sure. Not to mention it, like if you're serving a ton of people, like it makes it harder to fulfill, which makes you less efficient, right? Exactly. Because you have to tailor it to more people or more demographics instead of like just like Narrowing oh, I have down. yeah, I have one product process and I can just work on like fixing and like thing. always like so we used to do uh like for we used to do YouTube ads and Facebook ads and TikTok ads and then I was like you know what majority of our clients see success with Facebook ads let's get rid of YouTube and TikTok for uh for scaling systems not scaling initiative and so like every week every month we're always like do we need to like we used to install Hyros for all of our scaling systems clients but the majority of them you know they weren't spending enough money to where Hyros was really making sense so I was like all right let's get rid of Hyros for scaling with systems we'll leave it for scaling initiative so it's like not just uh, how can we um, like? How can we just give this one person as much as required? It's actually, you know, what's the least amount of work that we can do and that they can do in order to see that transformation? And yeah, so sure. I'm always just like shedding away our service delivery. Oh, I love that, man. It's, yeah, it's, it's huge. Sick. Yeah, it's huge. And man. it's simple. And the two words, you said leverage earlier, which yeah, I loved. Like, yeah. have you read Naval uh, Ravikant's um, The Almanac? I picked it up and then oh read like God, two pages. Dude. On your flight, on your <laughs> flight home, to, on your flight home, read it. read it. That thing is Get buried. badass. That, one of my favorite books I have ever. To check it out. For sure. But he said... Uh, Talks about leverage, like you said. Uh, you know, the outputs don't equal the inputs. Essentially, you put one thing and you get ten things out. Yeah. So I read that, and then also just where we're at scale wise as well. I'm like, okay, I need to stop focusing so much on complexity. And so I told my team first meeting of the year, all hands on. I was like, two keywords this year is leverage and simplicity. Those are like the two things that I want in our business. And yeah. like, if something, so you're in this podcast room right now. Everybody can't see this, but we used to have different cameras. Uh, we had a different setup that wasn't there before, uh, where we can see what's going on. And I used to have to have our creative director come and fly. Well, you've been talking to Jack to book yeah. this thing, come and fly out and, and be here and shooting these videos. And I was like, if this was simple, actually Tim Ferriss said this, but if this was simple, what would it look like? I was like, all right, sell the cameras. I don't give a shit. Get these two Sony A700s, whatever that I can literally just click and point. Get put tape on the ground so I can just start it myself. Uh, I just ordered a headphone so I could hear it so I don't have to have Zan hear it for us in the, the next time so I can yeah. hear what we sound like. So like set everything up so now I can shoot the full-blown podcast me sitting by myself in this room. You know what I mean? So like literally everything that we're doing, it's just like, if this were simple, what would this look like? And I can tell you that the stress levels that we, it's like unbelievable. And it's so silly, the little things, but it's making a big, dif big difference. For sure, man. And it, it makes you want to record content more, more. It makes you want to because it's literally just like so easy. all you have to do is just sit down and click a button and then click a button and then you can just like do whatever you want. Yeah. That's a that's how it's so funny. I walked in here, I was like, this kind of reminds me of my studio. I mean obviously it's not set up as a podcast, yeah. but I literally like I I mean I set up like set up the backdrop, whatever, and then it was just like literally mics basically the same cameras just looking back at me i just sit down i don't have to have anybody come in and i just like start it's recording. beautiful yeah, it's, it's like sick. it's so efficient and yeah. i think that word that i love the most in this world is efficiency but yeah like <laughs> leverage simplicity that's what yeah, um, for sure, bro. that's what we're all that's what i care about that's awesome man yeah Hell i appreciate yeah. that so uh dude epic podcast for sure it's been awesome having you on here i've learned quite yeah, a bit like not awesome. only on the ad side but also on the private equity side i like i could jam with you about private equity for a very long time and i'm sure we will after this is over as well yeah, of course um people that got a lot of value out of this um and learned a lot from you and uh, either they want to talk with you about you running ads with them or they would just want to learn with you or maybe even talk about potentially a private equity move like what's the best place for someone to find you and learn more cool yeah, I mean, you could just follow me. I'm not super active on social media. I'm more like building my business, although Ravi has pushed me to really start going <laughs> hard this year. Um, you can follow me. It's S-H-A-W-N-H-V-S. 
So on Instagram, um, or you can go to gambitsociety.com, which is, you know, b- previously people would have to pay anywhere from thirty to $50,000 a month plus rev share uh, to be able to work with us. Um, but we opened up a an offer where basically you can get to work with our team and we'll effectively set up everything for you, the hard work, uh, and then we'll train your team to do it. So realistically, my encouragement is don't hire another agency. Like it's unless you are at a certain level or even just it's just you want to speed up the process, right? You should hire and scale and build an internal team. And that's what we're going to do for you. And the cool part is we actually guarantee results in the first 30 days, your entire investment or your money back. So just gambitsociety.com. Um, and then you can schedule a call with one of my team members. I love it. I also love that name, the Gambit Society. That's Thanks, man. Name. Yeah, I love Gambit Society because it's like uh, in chess, a gambit, it's like an intentional sacrifice to win the game. Um, and that's, and I think that's kind of what we do all the time as business owners is like little sacrifices to be able to win the game long term. Wow. And that's how we built that's it. That's deep, man. Scaling the oh, systems, there's no meaning behind it. It's just right in the name right there. So I didn't think yeah. as deep as you did. Thanks, but bro. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, I appreciate you guys listening and I will see you in the next episode.